Here we go. Here's 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. And the Bible says this. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, you won't see rain. Yet the valley will be filled with water so that you and your cattle and your animals may drink. This is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. And he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Verse 20. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by the way of Edom and the land was filled with water. Go back to verse 16 real quick. Make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. I want to talk uh, for a couple of moments today from the subject, dig ditches. Dig ditches, dig ditches. Look at your neighbor and tell them, get a shovel. Can you tell them that? Get a shovel. Get a shovel. Get a shovel. Look at one more person. Tell them, get a shovel. Look at someone that looks really unfriendly and unhappy to be here and tell them, get a shovel. Get a shovel. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us and uh, help us as we explore this word. I pray you would build our faith, not just for what's going on right now in the church, but for where we are going as a people. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. And amen and amen. So the children of Israel, let me just give you a little context because we don't have time to really dig into it. But the children of Israel are in a need. They are out to battle and they're about to fight the Moabites and they set up camp in a valley and there's an issue. There's a problem. There's a need. And the need is there is no water. So the soldiers don't have water. The cattle do not have water and they don't know what to do. And quite frankly, it just encourages me because I love that the Bible is not a story of perfect people in perfect circumstances that never have to deal with anything. No, the Bible is full of broken people, people just like you, people just like me, people just like us that are in desperate need of a Savior, that are in desperate need of a miracle-working God, that are in desperate need of an ever-present God, and they find themselves in a situation where they need God. Anyone in this room ever been in a situation where you needed God? Can I, can I get a witness? Somebody. Have you ever been in a situation where you need a breakthrough, where you need a miracle, where you need God to do what only God can do? That's where they're at. And quite frankly, it's encouraging to know that I'm not alone in my need. I'm not alone in my own uh, need for miracles and breakthroughs. But I know that I can go to God's word and I can find principles and strategies and faith for my own fight, for my own battle, for my own situation and and they're in a valley and if they don't get water they're going to die they need a miracle if they don't get water their cattle is going to die if they don't get water they will not have the victory i just want to tell somebody today you might feel like you're in a valley today you might feel like you're in a dry place today. You might feel like you need a breakthrough. And if you don't get it, you are going to die. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. But I've come to tell somebody today, you're not going to die in the valley. You're not going to die in your fight, but you're going to make it in Jesus' name because God does not put you in a situation to let you die there, but you're there to see his faithfulness. You're there to see his goodness, and there, you're there to see the miracle working power of God. And so they have a need, and they go to the prophet. They go to Elisha, and they say, Elisha, we need water. And I love this about Elisha. They say, we need water, Elisha. And here's what he says. Point number one, dig a ditch. <laughs> I want you to grab that shovel that was on your seat and I want you to hold it. I want you to, I want you to hold on to it the rest of service. I want you to take it home with you. I want, I want you to put it by your bed tonight, by your nightstand tonight. And I just want you to think about this because here's what God does. God gives them an instruction. God's first instruction was not to pray. God's first instruction was not to fast. God's first instruction was not to quote the word or even to worship. He gave them an instruction that seemed so unspiritual. It seemed, it just seemed so kind of 
What, what does this have to do with our need, Elisha? We need rain. We don't need dirt. We need rain. We don't, we don't need whatever you're trying to tell us to do. Listen, God's instructions don't always make sense to your flesh, but they make sense to God. And as long as they make sense to God, we're going to be good. He said, dig a ditch. In other words, he said, go grab a shovel. Here's what he was really saying. Go make room for a miracle. Go prepare for a miracle. See, I'm from New Mexico, and in New Mexico, we have flash floods, and we have these things called arroyos, and we have these ditch banks that are all over. And the, the reason that they're set up, the reason that these systems are set up is because if you don't have a structure to hold that water, that water that could be a blessing, that water that could be your answer to prayer, that water that could be your lifesaver ends up becoming something that brings destruction and pain. God said, I'm going to answer you and give you what you need. But before I answer you, you have to create some structure so that when the answer comes it's a blessing to you and not harm to you some of you are praying for a man and God says dig a ditch some of you are saying Jesus I need a girl and he says dig a ditch some of you are praying for more stuff and God says before I give you more stuff I have to create structure in your life so that when the miracle is released it's not wasted or harmful but rather it blesses your life God God said, dig a ditch. He said, make room. He said, grab a shovel. Never forget this. Physical obedience brings spiritual breakthrough. <laughs> we want everything to be spiritual in God's kingdom, but the reality is there are some things that take our physical obedience. Friend, if you will do the ridiculous, God will do the miraculous. <laughs> And obedience always feels ridiculous until it works. It felt ridiculous moving into this school seven months ago and looking at a big, giant, white cafeteria. And I remember we looked at it and went, this cannot work. It was ridiculous, but now it works. And now it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we always knew that cafeteria would work. Yeah, it was going to be awesome. It didn't make sense. It was ridiculous, but anytime we're willing to do the ridiculous, God will reward it with the miraculous. I want you to catch this. They were soldiers. They weren't farmers. They knew how to handle a sword. They knew how to handle a bow and arrow. They knew how to handle an axe. They didn't know what to do with a shovel. God's instruction was not sharpen your sword. God's instruction was not prepare your arrows. God's instruction was not you know, pray for a miracle. God's instruction was start digging. Could you imagine the enemy? Could you imagine the Moabites looking out into the valley? And instead of an army preparing for battle, it's an army doing farm work? It looked ridiculous to the enemy. It felt ridiculous to God's people. But it made perfect sense to the Spirit of God. See, here's what God was really saying. I want you to humble yourself. Put down the sword and pick up a shovel. When Jesus, John 13, when Jesus knew, when Jesus knew, the Bible says, that all authority had been given to him and everything was under his feet. When Jesus knew that, John 13, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. When Jesus knew everything was under his feet, Jesus started washing feet. Because whenever God begins to elevate you, it's not so that you're above people, but it's so that you can even go lower and serve more people. The, the reason that God wants to give you influence and give this church influence and give me influence is not so that we can say we have influence, but it's so that we can wash more feet, so that we can serve more people, so that we can love more people, so that we can, can I get somebody to clap their hands, so that we can help more people. Friend, if you're too big to do something that is below you, you are too small for your destiny. <laughs> if, you're, if you're too big to do something that you think is below you, friend, you've missed it. You're too small for your destiny. <sighs> but if you will go low enough, long enough, 
God will raise you up in his timing. But it doesn't work the way we want it to work. God said, grab a shovel. Listen, every time we ask for a miracle, God gives us an instruction. Here's the, Bi the Bible's full of this. If you will, I will. If you will, I will. If you will, I will. Why? Because ob obedience brings blessing. Never forget that. Obedience brings blessing. This is just how God works. Obedience brings blessing. Now, why does God do it this way? Here's why he does it this way. Because he doesn't want to just do something for you. He wants to do something with you. He wants to do something with, this is why he would look at someone he heals and he goes, your faith made you well. It wasn't their faith. Pfft. It was his power. It was Jesus being Jesus. It was God being God. They had faith before that. What, what was it? It was Jesus saying, we partnered. It was about 99.99.99.99.99.9% my grace. And it was 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1 your faith. But now you're a part of the miracle. So now you can go tell your friends, yeah, I believed God and look what God did for me. Yeah, I obeyed God and look what God did for me. Yeah, I've been walking with God and look what God did for me. In other words, it's now a partnership and it's not just God doing something, but now it's a divine partnership. It's a father and son. It's a father and child because we're not just his servants. We're not just humans to him, but we are his children. And then whenever we obey God, we get to brag on dad. We get to brag on our father. We get to brag on the goodness of our God. And now it's not just us watching God do God stuff, but it's us being a part of the miracle. This is the blessing. This is your testimony. This is the, 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 the blessing of being a child of God that you are in partnership with God that's why God said I'm a co-heir with Christ I'm an heir of God I'm a represent I'm a representative of Jesus why because we're doing it together we're not just watching God but we're walking with God this is what God does so he said Noah build a boat Elijah build an altar Peter, walk out on the water. Disciples, we got to feed 15,000 people. Set them into groups of 50. Woman in a famine, you're hungry and you have no food, make me a cake first. That's the preacher's favorite scripture right there in Jesus' name. <laughs> Widow in debt, go gather vessels. Naaman, go dip seven times. God asks people all through the Bible, you go do the ridiculous, and I will do the miraculous. So they dig ditches. But here's point number two to a miracle. Point number two is you got to sleep on it. You got to sleep on it. Look at your neighbor and say, sleep on it. Now, here, here's an amazing verse. Verse 16, 17, and 18, God says, do all this stuff, right? Verse 18, now in the morning. Notice that. Here's what that means. It means they went to bed that night without their miracle. Can you imagine that at dinner? All day they've been digging ditches. All day they've been out in the sun. All day they've been out doing the ridiculous. All day they've been out there going... Elisha has lost his mind. This man is a kook. And then that night, they're at dinner eating with the prophet. And they go, okay, so prophet, we, we dug ditches. Uh, now what? And Elisha says, I, I didn't get that part from God. So I just heard dig ditches. See, God never gives you the full story. Because if he gave you the full story, it wouldn't require faith. So he gives you just enough to inspire you, but then he gives you not enough so that you have to fall on your face and believe him. He, he, gives, you enough, he gives you enough of the word to inspire your faith to act, but then it takes you trusting in the waiting. So he said, Joseph, I'm going to give you a dream of a nation bowing before you. And he went, oh, that's awesome. But God forgot to tell Joseph about the pit and the prison and the Potiphar's wife. Because if God told you everything, it would be so big and so scary, we would never do anything. 
So he gives you just enough to activate faith. But not enough so that it's going to take trust. So they dig the ditches and nothing happens. And Elisha says, well, let's go to bed. Listen, because when you've done all you know to do, rest. Did you catch it? When you've done all you know, I've prayed my prayers and I've given my offerings and I've quoted the scripture and I've prayed in English and I prayed in tongues and I prayed in Spanish and I went online, learned how to pray in French. I've done everything I know to do. What do I do when I've done all I know to do? Rest. What do I do when I've done everything I, I think God told me to do? Rest. Wait. Trust. I want you to think about it that night as they finished dinner. They went to bed thirsty. They went to bed in need. They went to bed with cracked lips. They went to bed with a dry mouth. They went to bed uncomfortable. They went to bed weary. They went to bed dehydrated. They went to bed hot. They went to bed bothered. They went to bed with probably not the best attitude towards their pastor, Pastor Elisha. They, I, I promise you there was some tension. If there was a Twitter account back then, there would have been subtweets. I promise you. There would have been some ugly, cryptic Facebook messages. I'm telling you right now. But Elisha said, rest. God said, sleep on it. Relax. Take, I've, I've come to tell somebody, take a deep breath. Let your hair down, kick your shoes off, close your eyes and rest. Stop trying to move the miracle faster than God is moving it. Rather, just wait on it, rest on it, sleep on it, and trust that God is going to do what only God can do. Can you look at your neighbor real quick, tell them sleep on it, sleep on it. Can you high five somebody around you, tell them sleep on it, sleep on it. Sleep on it. Sleep on it. Listen, here's such a huge key. Put it up on the screen. While you are sleeping, God is working. Oh, I said, while you're sleeping, God is working because the psalmist said, the psalmist said, he neither sleeps nor slumbers. Oh, this is good news for the child of God. Why can I sleep? Because I know God's awake. Why can I slumber? Because I know God is attentive. Why can I close my eyes? Because I know God's eyes are wide open. Why can I rest? Because I know God's working on my behalf. When I've done everything I know to do, I give it to the hand of God. And I say, God, I'm going to go to bed. You take on the night shift and you do what only you can do because while you're sleeping, God is working. Can I get everybody to clap your hands one time and thank God for it? Come on. So they wake up. And I think they probably woke up looking at each other going, okay, we, we had a pretty bad attitude with pastor yesterday. We need to, okay. I know there's water outside. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know he's a man of God. I've seen fire from heaven. I know this guy. I know this guy. And they walk outside, and there's just ditches. And it's dry. And they look at their pastor, and they go, let me just tweet something real quick, pastor. And they were so mad. You could just imagine. You, see, you don't just read the Bible. You read the Bible. You got to put your emotion into it. They wake up and there's nothing. You, you got you to gotta feel how they were feeling. You got to imagine what the devil was saying. What have you gotten yourself into? What have you? And then they do something so crazy. Verse 20. They gave a grain offering. Huh. Now, it's not in the text, but I assume it was Elisha's idea. Well, no water. Let's give away our food. Just imagine this. And their jaws drop. Dude, what? They, they needed water. And now they're about to give away their food. That's in your Bible. It's in verse 20. Now, here's what a grain offering is. It's very interesting. A grain offering was at the end of harvest. And it was a gift to God to thank him for everything that came in. 
It was a gift at the end of the miracle. And Elisha said, let's give it right in the middle of the miracle. If we had water, I'd give him water. But we ain't got no water. So I'm going to give him what I got. And I'm going to trust him for what I need. So they get some grain. Now here's the amazing thing about it. They get, they're giving God a thanksgiving offering, but they haven't received the miracle yet. They're thanking Him in advance for what they believe God will do. This is such a powerful principle because in the book of Proverbs, God said it like this, I am a debtor to no man. I will make sure you get back what you've given. When we give to God, God remembers it. And in the mouth, from the mouth of God, God is now indebted to that seed to get it back to you. Oh, this is huge. This is so massive. So, so they give. But now here's the next thing about a grain offering that's crazy. It's a burnt offering. You know what a burnt offering feels like? When you put the money in the bucket, and there it goes. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> when by faith, you get up just enough courage, to, <laughs> you drop it in, and as soon as it drops and it's two people down, you just, the devil goes, you're an idiot. Bye, money. Because he'll start talking to you. And can you imagine them holding their grain, their food? And Elisha starts passing around some rock to start a fire. And they're going, okay, yeah, 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 this is going to be great. Uh, it's going to be great. It, it was ridiculous, but it unlocked the miraculous. It, it, it didn't make sense to their flesh, but it made perfect sense to God. F your flesh hates faith. Your flesh hates, it doesn't make, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't calculate. But your spirit begins to soar when you walk in faith. And if you could only imagine, they need water. Now they're burning up their food. It's as if they gave themselves into an even greater problem but no they were not giving themselves into a bigger problem they were giving themselves into a miracle they were giving themselves into something so great they were in need but they began to thank God in advance for his faithfulness I want you to think about it when they gave that offering here's what they were really doing God you've been so faithful and I know you're going to be faithful and I don't see rain, I don't smell rain, I don't sense rain, I don't, I don't see how it's going to happen. But God, you're going to be faithful because you've always been faithful. B basically, if, if it was 2018, they'd have started singing, do it again. I've seen you move. I've seen you move the mountains. I know you're going to do it again. So Lord, by faith, we're going to give this offering, trusting you that who you've always been is who you will always be in my life. So today, I don't want you to give to City Light because we have a need. I want you to give because you are grateful for all God has done for you and all God has been to you. Please don't give today going, oh, Shaban needs to raise $40,000 for the building. I better, I better help him out. I don't, I don't want that. Well, I feel pressured. I don't want that for sure. But if there's a sense of gratitude and expectation in your heart that says, I want to be a part of something. And I'm so grateful for how far God has brought us. Then I want you to give. And they obeyed and they dug ditches and they rested and they went to bed. And then they began to thank God and they gave that offering. And notice this, as they gave, the water began to flow. Oh, but I got, this is crazy. It never rained in the valley. 
They never saw a cloud. They never heard a thunder. They never saw a lightning in the distance. They never felt moisture come down from heaven. They never saw it. The Bible says, and water began to flow from Edom. Hundreds of miles away, God was preparing their miracle as they were preparing their offering. And they're staring at the fire and they're hearing the crackle and they're smelling the smoke. And all of a sudden, the sound of the fire gets covered up by the sound of water. And they begin to hear that river flow coming down. And I've seen flash floods. I know what it looks like. And you can look down and it looks like nothing's coming, but you hear it before you ever see it. And then boom, that water comes at literally over 100 miles an hour. It's one of the craziest things you'll ever see. And because they had dug ditches and because they had prepared, they were ready for the abundance. See, that's why I'm not praying for God grow city like church. I'm not praying that. You know what I'm doing? I'm starting a third service. Because why would I why would we do two services and pray God grow us and God goes, You don't have any more seats, dum dum. So what we're gonna do is we're starting a nine o'clock and a ten fifteen and an eleven forty five. We're not just praying for growth, we're preparing for growth. We're digging ditches and it might feel ridiculous at first, but it always feels ridiculous at first, but then it looks miraculous once the hand of God gets involved and the water begin to flow and I just want to tell somebody that I don't know where you are right now but God is preparing rain in Edom God is doing something in other places he's working behind the scenes he's dealing with other people that are going to bless your life you may not ever even see the rain with your own eyes but you will see the provision of God as he is preparing it around you listen as they gave the water begin to flow i'm not here today to tell you that if you give you know tomorrow you're going to wake up and there's going to be a mercedes in your front parking lot i'm not here today that if you'll give a thousand god will give you ten thousand no no listen i am not a casino i am not a slot machine i don't know if you knew that i don't make false promises i'm not a greasy preacher at 3 a.m on bet looking at you in the camera trying to sell you red oil saying come give me some money and i'm going to send you some oil that they say is from jerusalem but it's really from new jersey listen to me I haven't come to tell you any of that. I've come to tell you if you'll give, it will create a flow. I've come to tell you if you'll give, a river will begin to flow in your life. I've come to, I'm not, it's not about one big amount miracles. It's about a flow. Look at your neighbor say, it's a flow. It's a flow. Not it's a vibe. It's a flow. It's a flow. I'm telling you, God will create a flow of provision. God will create a flow of abundance where you don't even have to live from big miracle to big miracle, but you live off the river of your own generosity and you're able to see the constant and consistent provision of God. Whew. It began to flow and I would have just hated to be one of the dudes in the back still holding on to my grain. And while the burnt offerings are being washed up, I go, oh yeah, praise God, praise God. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to be a part of the miracle. See, I want, to, I want us to be a part of the miracle so that on, on August 9th when we sit in that room and someone sits in that chair that you paid for and they raise their hand to receive Jesus, and you can say, I was a part of the offering. And, and when a couple that's on the brink of divorce is sitting there hearing the word and they hold hands for the first time in months, and by the grace of God, they're going to make it, and you can say, I was a part of that. And when little kids are in kids' ministry, we send them off to camp, and we do different things, and those kids get saved, and those kids get filled with the Holy Spirit, and those kids find their calling, and those kids find out who they are in Jesus, and you can go, I was a part of that river. I was a part of that flow. I was a part of that abundance. And when, and when people get physically healed, and God heals people of different diseases in that building, and you can say, I was a part of that. I was there. And, when, and whenever you're worshiping, and you bring your friend, and you're nervous because you're going, what is Jabin going to 
going to say and how's this all going to work out and I really hope and then all of a sudden they just kind of lift their hands and they begin to engage and then they receive Christ at the end of service and you go I was there I was a part of see see this isn't about paint this isn't about carpet this isn't about chairs it's about who is going to see the paint it's about who's going to stand on the carpet it's about who's going to sit in the chair it's about who's going to hear the sound system it's about who's going to bring their kit it has nothing to do with structure it had nothing to do with the ditches it had everything to do with God's provision and it has nothing to do with a building concrete and paint and wood it has everything to do with the people of God that will gather in that place and find hope and healing and find what God has for them friend today we are not giving just to give and we're not giving just for a building but we're giving for an opportunity and not only will it bless many, many people, but it will bless you. Generosity creates a flow in our life. And today, I know many of you have prepared for this miracle offering, and I just want to say thank you, and the keys can come up. I want to thank you for believing in the dream that is City Light. And um, I want to just show you a scripture that has always been in my heart. I was thinking about it this week. It's the scripture that I have shared since day one of us gathering at this school, since the very first little prayer meeting out in that back court, courtyard that I wasn't going to have because I was tired and hungry. And Lisa Heyer said, hey, why don't we just pray before we end? And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, praise God, praise God. Yeah, let's pray. I was about, that was my idea. I was going to say that. And we prayed out in a circle and I shared this scripture. And I said, guys, let me just tell you why we're doing this. We're going to make God a sanctuary. A place where he can dwell among us. And it's been my prayer every day since we planted this church. God, I want to build you a house. I want to build you a place where heaven We'll kiss earth and we'll be caught up in the middle. I want to build you a place like Jacob said, this is the house of God where angels ascend and descend. God, I want to build you a house. 